Okay, welcome. So our topic tonight is soil in your home garden and our speakers are Mike Corby and John Fike. We have two seasoned University of California Master Gardener volunteers and they'll talk to us about the soil in your home garden and the universe under your feet. There is indeed life in that soil. It's essential to the health of your plants. And Mike and John are gonna debunk some commonly held beliefs about soil care. This evening, we're gonna begin our talk with Mike Corby. Karen, thank you very much. Um, everyone out there this evening, welcome on this uh, sort of rainy evening that we're getting. Uh, hope you're all well. Um, so as we, we start out, I, I, we like to kind of start with this slide. And, um, and what we really call the slide is good cultural care. And, and what it is, is the four foundations of, of successful gardening, whether you're growing ornamentals or you're growing veggies, um, all of these four are really essential. So, you know, we're gonna start off and we're gonna talk a lot this evening about soil. And, and soil really is the basis for a healthy garden. You know, where would we be without then water and uh, number three there, aeration, which is basically the air that's in your soil. We'll talk a little bit about that this evening as well, because uh, sometimes we underestimate the value of air in that soil. And then lastly, of course, is sunlight. Uh, sunlight is the engine that provides the energy for us and for our gardens. And so in the larger context, uh, soil and air temperatures, which are also determined by sunlight, are really critical for, for plant health. And you know, our goal as master gardeners is for your garden to thrive. And so um, hopefully this evening we'll, uh, we'll give you some insights into soil. And so the uh, kind of our objectives, John's and my objectives for this evening, hopefully is to give you a definition of soil. What is it? Why is it important? Where did it come from? Um, you know, sometimes we take that for granted. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the properties of soil, both its physical properties, its chemical and biological, and, uh, and talk a little bit about soil as a renewable resource. So when we ask what is soil? Uh, well, it's different things to different people. Um, if you talk to a soil engineer, uh, they're thinking about soil with respect to perhaps building properties. Um, is this uh, stable enough to put a building on or a road upon? Uh, a geologist might be looking at soil for the minerals that it contains. And as gardeners, we really look at soil as the medium that we're gonna grow things in. And, uh, and understanding the soil is, is gonna give us a good indication of what we can do successfully in our gardens. So as kind of a simple definition of what soil is, uh, Basically, soil is a unique ecosystem, and we're going to talk a lot about that idea of an ecosystem this evening. Uh, combining organic and inorganic materials that deliver food, fiber, building materials to the majority of the world's living organisms. So, you know, basically, soil is a natural resource, and, and we should recognize soil as a natural resource. And, and the building of soil has been going on for hundreds of millions of years. So why is soil important? Uh, I think this kind of sums it up pretty well. This was a study that was done by Cornell University. Uh, humans obtain more than 99.7% of their food calories from the land. Uh, and that's either directly through the consumption of, uh, of plants and grains or it's uh, through uh, secondary consumption of other foods that have consumed those plants. So less than three tenths of 1% of our uh, general diet comes from aquatic ecosystems. So why is that kind of important to us? Well, if we think about this big green and blue marble that we, uh, we live on here, if we were to break that down and say, how much land we call arable land is there on this earth? And so what I've done is I've kind of taken the earth and laid it out as a grid. These little squares represent portions of our earth, okay? So when we start off, three quarters of the earth is covered by oceans, okay? So that eats up the majority of what we have on the surface of this planet. Another eighth is too hot, too cold, too dry, too wet, 
for us to grow crops. 330 seconds of the earth is covered by mountains, roads, or cities. And so when we come to the final tally here, we've got one little square left. So that's 132nd of the earth's surface is actually available for us to grow food on. Um, that's about 3% of the earth's surface. So not really a lot. So it's really, really important that we take care of what we have because uh, we don't all understand that through growing populations of this planet and how important it's gonna be in the future to make sure there's adequate food supplies for people. And we can all do our part for that. So let's, let's kind of take soil and break it up for a little bit. And uh, let's start with talking about the physical properties of soil. If we look at this pie chart here, um, air represents 25% of our soil ideally. And, um, and so when we take and we break soil down, um, really it comes down to these four components. Um, about 5% of your soil is organic matter. Okay, that's, uh, you know, you think about the season we've been in with leaf fall and everything. And John's gonna really take you through that in, in just a few minutes. The other three components are minerals, what we call minerals, water and air. And really the, the thing that's important to consider here is that if you look at soil, half of it is solid, um, which I think we all recognize, but the other half is what we call pore space, okay? And that's the space between the solids that allow water and air and roots and other things to get into that soil. Um, and, and, you know, I, I really wanna emphasize the, the, the piece that John's gonna talk about, the organic matter. Um, if I were to take that just 5%, which doesn't seem like a lot, but if I take that 5% out and we just had minerals, water, and air, basically we have dirt. Uh, and really it, the key to living healthy soil is, is organic matter. Um, but it's just one component of it. And so everything needs to work together, as I mentioned in the, in the uh, definition, as an ecosystem. So another way maybe to think about this, um, if you like to cook at home, um, take a bowl and throw a bunch of flour and water in it, maybe a little bit of salt. And what do you have? You have paste, all right? But take just a small amount of yeast. In fact, when you're making bread, about one to 2% of the weight of those ingredients is yeast. Uh, but then what do you have? Then you have bread dough, something magical and wonderful. And, and that's kind of the same thing that's gonna happen with the organic materials in your soil. So uh, John's gonna, like I say, uh, give you more information on that. And uh, it is really truly magical to what's gonna happen in your garden. Okay, so let's take a minute and just talk about the minerals themselves. So what are they? Where do they come from? So the majority of the soil that we have around us is what we call mineral soil, see? And, 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 and rocks, basically mineral soil comes from decomposing rocks. And, and that process of decomposing we call weathering. Um, and then when that rock weathers, um, it can actually get moved around. And, uh, and that's what we call erosion. And a, and a great example of erosion, obviously is our great central valley. Um, you know, through eons and eons of weathering of the, of the great Sierra Nevada range, and then the erosion of that, that weathering carried down beautiful soil from those mountains and, and filled the, the Central Valley. And the Central Valley, as we, you know, most of us in California know is one of the richest growing areas in the world. And, uh, and actually in places there, we have topsoil that exceeds six feet in depth. So um, that's, that's kind of a, an example of how the, the soil begins. But uh, the next slide here I wanna share with you guys is sort of a, a series of four panels that talks about how this process happens. So it's really, it's a top to bottom process as you see from that arrow on the left-hand side. And then across the bottom, you'll see on the arrow, it talks about weathering over time. And this does take a lot of time. Typically it can take from 500 to a thousand years to create one inch of topsoil. 
So if we take the first panel on the left, uh, what that panel represents is rock. Uh, and rock is the most common material on the earth. Um, you know, we know that this is just, this planet we're on is, is basically is a big rock. And, uh, but over time, that weathering I talked about, things like freeze thaw and rain and wind and, and other biological um, elements will begin to take that rock and break it down. And as that rock continues to break down, as we look at the second panel there, you can see it starts becoming smaller and smaller pieces. When those pieces get smaller and those fissures appear, then there's the opportunity for that air and that water, that pore space that we talked about, uh, to actually penetrate between the rock. And as it does on our third panel over, you can see that at that point we're giving parcel, we're giving uh, an opportunity for plants to begin to grow in, in, the, uh, in this uh, broken down soil. And, you know, something I really love to share is um, my wife and I get an opportunity every few years to go over to Hawaii and visit over there. And we, we certainly do all the, the typical things that you do in Hawaii, but, but honestly, one of my favorite things is to spend a night or two up on the Kilauea volcano. And uh, I'm always fascinated when I go up there to walk across the lava flows. And you look around you and there's just nothing but cooled lava, just a, a dead rocky surface. Um, but occasionally as you're walking by, you're gonna see little steam vents. And what I'm absolutely fascinated by is the fact that as that rock cooled and air is now able to pass through it and the moisture from the rain and the moisture from the, and the heat from the steam that's coming out of those steam vents. And I look down and there's a new plant. There's a new plant growing. And, uh, and you just look at that and you just hope that it's gonna get through its entire life cycle. It's going to, it's going to grow, it's gonna reproduce. Uh, that plant will eventually die. When it dies, it's gonna add organic material to the top of that soil. We hope that the, uh, the, the seeds take uh, root and, uh, and that cycle continues because that cycle is incredibly important to soil. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little more. But on that fourth panel then what you see is this buildup of organic material. And then you see the soil actually breaks into horizons. Um, and when we talk about soil, we basically talk about soil in its horizons. And so that very top little layer there that's called organic matter is, is very simply called the O horizon. Uh, below that is the A horizon and the B horizon, which is commonly called topsoil. And then as we go further down, um, you can see that in the, about the middle of that panel, what we call the sea horizon, is still that parent material that's going to continue to break down. And then below that is, is bedrock. And you know, one of the things I think is really interesting about this and something that we should consider is the fact that you know, the, the, the first evidence of plant life on the earth began about 500 million years ago. So this cycle of plants, uh, seeding, growing, reproducing, and dying, and creating organic material began about 500 million years ago. Um, you know, we as humans, as modern humans, we've been on the earth for about 100,000 to 200,000 years. Uh, and I only bring that up because the fact is, is that nature has got this process down pretty good. And uh, so when we think about soil, we've got to really think about the fact of uh, what are we going to do to, to make it better than what nature does, okay? And actually, if you think about modern agriculture, modern agriculture has only been in existence for about 10 to 12,000 years. So again, you know, these are things that are very dependent on the soil, and yet uh, the process of creating soil has been on, going on for a very, very long time. As I mentioned, uh, as, as parent material breaks down, uh, we end up with three types of soil. In the larger scheme of things, when we, you talk about the geologists or you talk to uh, soil engineers, uh, they basically break down most of the, that weathered rock that we talk about to boulders and from boulders down to gravel, gravel down to sand, sand down to silt, and silt down to clay. So um, in this particular case, uh, we really designate these particles based on their particle size, okay? 
So soil texture is really how soil feels, okay? And, and what we do is we, when we talk about soil, we talk about it from a coarse to a fine soil. Uh, largest being coarse soils, and then smallest particles being fine soils. And, and, and each of these is important. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the things that we, we talk about here is um, what the influence of each of these is gonna have on the plants and, uh, and the things that you're trying to grow in your garden, okay? So if we talk about the, the different types, one of the first is sand. Sand is, is a very common uh, soil type around the world. Uh, most li likely comes from uh, decomposed granite. Um, and, you know, as gardeners, it's really important, I think, that we, we get really accustomed to get our hands dirty. Um, and so getting comfortable with your soil, getting to know your soil, getting your hand into the soil. And if you take up a handful of soil and it feels real gritty, uh, take, that, take that soil and try and make a ball out of it. And if you open your hand back up and that doesn't hold together, uh, then you probably have very, very sandy soil. Um, and and in, we all know that sand drains very well. I mean, you go to the beach and you build a sand castle, the wave hits it and it's gone. And you to try and dig a hole and it, the, the sand quickly shifts back into it. Um, but that high permeability that we call it, it doesn't really hold moisture well. And we all know that our plants need moisture. And so that can, that can be a bit of an issue. Um, and sand, because of its makeup, um, doesn't really hold organic matter very well as either. Um, and so what can, what can happen there is nutrients in the soil can leach through very, very quickly. So if you have sandy soil, you wanna think about watering it a little bit less, but more frequently. And if you fertilize sandy soil, you wanna take and really cut down on the amount of fertilizer you're using, but then apply it in a lesser amount on a more frequent basis. And this will help with feeding the plants but will uh, reduce some of the leaching that is uh, sort of a characteristic of sandy soil. So silty soil, um, and there's quite a bit of silty soil around here between, uh, uh, especially on the Eastern part of the, uh, of the county. Uh, and silt is a lot like sand. Um, basically it, it is, uh, is still gritty. Um, it's, it's smaller than a sand particle. Um, but much, much bigger still than clay. Um, and because it's smaller, you think about it as, as uh, a slightly smaller pipe. So the, the, the water doesn't run through it quite as quickly. Um, and when it dries out, it feels pretty fluffy. Um, and generally silt is, is like I said, it's, it's similar to sand, but we find a lot of it um, uh, forming underwater. So lakes, streams, rivers, things like that. It's typically where you're gonna find silt. Okay, and lastly is clay. It's, it is absolutely the very smallest of the soil types. Uh, and, and clay is one of those that, again, if you look at, at these three types, um, really what we're looking at is just the further uh, weathering of a parent material into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, and sand and silt are still pretty much just tiny little rocks. Okay, but when you get down to the size of clay, Clay actually goes through a chemical change. Um, and if you look at clay, you have to, to see clay, a clay particle, you really have to look at it under a micro, uh, electronic microscope. Um, and it's so, so tiny, but it, it, it's no longer, when you would see it under that, that microscope, it's no longer looking like just a little rock. Um, they actually look like little plates. So they're very, very flat and they stack together very tightly. Um, which is one of the reasons it can be very difficult to work with clay. Um, but because those, those particles are so small, um, they do hold moisture better. Um, and they actually have the capacity to hold nutrients. And we'll talk a, a bit about nutrients in a couple of minutes here, but, um, but clay has a unique uh, capacity to hold on to, to nutrients. Um, because of its density, as, as we're you know, coming into spring, uh, it probably is not gonna warm up as quickly as the other two soil types would. Um, 
And especially right now, I mean, as you know, this evening we all know we're getting rain. Um, clay is highly susceptible to compaction, um, which basically means that um, we're forcing out that pore space that we talked about, we're forcing out the air and the water. So, um, and that obviously is detrimental to your plants and it makes it more difficult to work with your, uh, with the soil in your garden. So you hear about loamy soil a lot and, and I, I kind of call loamy soil the Goldilocks soil. Uh, you know, it's, it's neither too fast or too hard or too soft, it's just right. Um, so really loamy soils are just a combination of the three soil types. So uh, the USDA describes or defines uh, loamy soil as about 40% sand, 40% silt, 20% clay. And, and because of that, it, it, it's, it's, it's more drought resistant. It, it, it holds moisture better. Uh, it warms up quickly in the spring, which is important for new plants. Um, it'll hold uh, nutrients better and uh, it has very, very good inf infiltration of both uh, air and water. So we're kind of defining the, the principles of soil here, but you know, there are times when you're gonna need to go out and you're gonna need to purchase soil. Um, and this is especially true because um, a lot of plants depend on different types of soils. Um, some soils like a sandy, uh, medium to work, uh, some plants like a, uh, a sandy medium to work in, uh, others like a grittier uh, uh, medium to work in. So if, if you're going to purchase soil, um, you know, for whatever reason, um, the best place to go would be to a landscape center if you can uh, and get it there. Um, some landscape centers uh, sell soil in bulk, some will sell it um, in packages for you. But um, it's great if you can go there because you can ask where the soil came from. And that's really, really important um, because a lot of times soil can be just scraped up from places that um, um, are maybe going through a transformation of being old farmland and going into uh, construction, um, or they could be an old industrial site that the, the soil is being scraped up from. So you really wanna know where that soil came from. You know, another reason you may buy soil is because um, you don't have a garden, you don't have a backyard, you don't have that space, you, you have a small patio or you have a balcony and, and you're, you're, you want to grow plants uh, either for edibles or for uh, something that's just a beautiful flower and you're going to use containers. Um, and, and really the key to containers is the fact that um, you want that, that, that porosity, you want the, the pore space there, but uh, it's, it's really important in container gardening to get good drainage. Uh, and so then you might be thinking about packaged soils. Uh, you know, we see things like potting mix and things of that nature. And just a couple of things to keep in mind there is um, most of those are made from forest products. And uh, so if you're buying packaged materials, uh, read the labels, uh, and read what's in them. And, uh, you know, some of them may say that they, they contain things like um, sand or vermiculite or perlite or things like that. And they'll say that they put those in there to retain moisture, which they do. Um, but, you know, they, in a lot of ways, those are similar to what we talked about in garden soils. And uh, so there's, you're not going to have the minerals um, that you're going to have in regular soil. So there's nothing wrong with these, um, but just think about it. Um, and again, it, it's just important to look at what's in those, in those um, particular packages or what the uh, landscape center says. Um, so that uh, when, when you learn more about the soil, you can make decisions about whether or not you feel comfortable with that particular type in your garden or in your containers. Okay, so we talked about the fact that none of us has uh, a garden or, you know, it's pretty rare to have a garden that would be all sand, all silt, or all clay. Um, basically, we have a mix. Um, it may not be a perfect loam, but uh, we have a mix and, and that mix comes together and, and, and we call that an aggregate. And the, the large particles that you see in this illustration here are, are the sand particles. And they tend to, to remain fairly separate, um, but the clay and the silt will begin to come together and build what, what I mentioned as aggregates. And aggregates, are, aggregates also um, 
are built with uh, the soil roots and, uh, and the other organic materials that John's gonna talk about. But good granular structure is what allows that movement of air and water within the soil. So you can see there in the middle, um, as we have the large sand particles, the middle sized silt particles and those teeny tiny clay particles. And then in between them is that source, that pore space that we talk about. And, and that's what allows the moisture to move through there, the air to move through there, and ultimately for your roots to move through there. Um, so this is, you know, there may be not, not be a lot you can do with respect to your uh, texture of your soil, but there is a lot you can do with structure. And uh, again, something that uh, John will describe further for us in a few minutes. So along with that, um, a really important part of soil is what we call surface area. Uh, basically surface area is where that water and those nutrients can land. Uh, and in the illustration here, um, if you were to think about this as uh, the large soil types or soil particles down to the smaller, um, if we start on the left and we had a one meter by one meter by one meter block, okay, well that, that basically calculates out the six square meters. But if I were to take that and break it up, and so that now I, I broke it up into quarters, so now I have eight of these little squares. Um, each being half as big as the original, I go to 12 square meters. And if I were to break that up again into a quarter of a meter, I now have 24 square meters of space. So when it comes to being able to hold nutrients and hold water, smaller particles are better. And I know that kind of seems counterintuitive. Um, we always think as, as, as larger things having more surface area. But if you thought about a room in your house and you filled it with basketballs and then you turned around and you filled it with golf balls, the amount of surface area on the golf balls would be significantly greater. And the amount of surface area that clay has opposed to sand is about 10,000 times more surface area. Or another good little example is you take a deck of cards and when that deck is all together, it's about 25 square inches of surface area. But when you separate all those individual cards, now you have over a thousand square inches of surface area. So you can see where in this particular case, smaller is actually better. So we talked about the minerals, we talked about the solid. Let's talk a little bit about the pore space. Uh, and the pore space again is made up of half water and half air, but that's variable. Uh, and a good example of that would be if we get a real deluge overnight, uh, the portion of your soil that's water is going to go up um, and the portion of air is going to go down. But then through drainage, through that pore space, um, within a day or so, you're going to come back to equilibrium. So we'll talk a little bit about water for just a minute because water is just a, a really, really interesting um, element in our world. Um, I know we all think about watering our plants so that they stand up straight and don't wilt. Um, but water is actually called the universal solvent uh, because it actually dissolves more substance than any other liquid. Um, and so when we think about that, right, you, you use water to wash our cars or our, our dishes at night. Um, and, and it is a great solvent because it dissolves so many things. Um, and water, water molecules are, are, are very adhesive. They love to grab onto things. Um, and you know, a good example of that is you rinse a glass, right? And you see a bunch of water beads on it. And that's, that's what water likes to do. It, 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 uh, it likes to adhere to things. And so when, when there's an adequate amount of moisture in your soil, water's gonna reach out and it's gonna grab your roots, the roots of your plants, and it's going to grab those soil particles, okay? And when it goes across those, that's what's known as, as a soil solution. Um, now, it's really important that we don't have too much water in, in our soil because um, plants need that air also, and plants can drown. And I, I think we've all experienced that. In fact, I think as master gardeners, we, we, get, we see more people that... Uh, that uh, hurt their plants through too much water than through too much uh, or too little water. 
So, and then the air portion of this is important. One for oxygen, just like us, uh, you know, we need oxygen to help the cells to break down the sugars in those roots that are produced by the photosynthesis. Air also provides carbon and nitrogen uh, into that because uh, nitrogen and carbon are, are found abundantly in the air. So those, those other two are very, very important and air, as John will talk about, also supports the, uh, the organic life in your soil. So we'll talk for a quick minute about the chemical properties. Uh, don't groan here, I'm not gonna go too geeky on you, uh, but uh, this part is, is also really, really important and it's something I don't think that gets discussed nearly enough. So plants, just like human beings, need nutrients. Uh, you know, we think about plants feeding themselves uh, from photosynthesis, but that's just half of the equation, okay? And so plants also need nutrients that come from the minerals in the soil. Um, just like we need calcium for our bones and iron for our red blood cells, uh, plants need these as well. And there's actually 17 essential elements that plants need to really thrive. Um, and we break these out between macronutrients and micronutrients. And, and macronutrients, we can split one more time and we can say you know, that the carbon, the hydrogen, the oxygen, the nitrogen come from the air. And then the phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur come from the soil, from the minerals in the soil. Um, and you'll notice that I have three of them here that are underlined and kind of bolded, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the three that we are usually pretty uh, aware of, uh, the three macronutrients that are usually printed on the side of a fertilizer bag. Uh, but it's really important when you think about fertilizing and you think about fertility for your plants that you have a balanced food. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, more and more and more as we, we become aware of this and we think about um, nutrients on our plants, we begin to think more about organic. And, and just like buying soil, uh, it's important to read the package on, uh, on fertilizers as well. Um, and really, um, you know, I saw a great definition the other day that sort of compared chemical fertilizers to uh, organic fertilizers. And, and the biggest difference between the two was that chemical fertilizers are formulated to feed your plant. And organic fertilizers are formulated to feed your soil. Um, and as John takes you through the, the organic part of soil, you're gonna see that that's really an important distinction. Um, and when I talk about the micronutrients here, um, these are actually every bit as important to the plant as those macronutrients are. Um, it's just that a macronutrient is something that a plant consumes a lot of, just like your body consumes a lot of iron. Um, but it doesn't mean that those micronutrients aren't needed. It's just that they're not needed in the same quantity. And typically the micronutrients that um, are available in your soil today are gonna be enough to take care of your plant. Um, now, you know, another, another piece of this is the fact that um, before modern agriculture, um, there was what we called nutrient cycling. And so I mentioned that earlier when we talked about how soil was formed. And that really is um, the fact that we see these nutrients that are down here. Um, um, they're absorbed up into the plant. But when the plant dies, um, a lot of those nutrients are actually put back into the soil. So I, you know, one of the things that I think uh, a lot of gardeners do that can be very detrimental to the soils. You know, a plant is, is either no longer fruiting or perhaps it's no longer flowering and uh, gardeners come along and they just rip it out by the roots and it goes into a compost bin or it goes, uh, or even unfortunately goes into the green bin. And uh, in that particular case, uh, all those nutrients don't get recycled back into the soil. So, um, you know, you're gonna hear a lot about um, nutrient cycling um, and just how important that is to keeping your, your soil healthy. Um, so when we talk about nutrients and we talk about how do they get to the plant, um, this gets into some really interesting research. And, uh, and one of the things that I think John and I can admit to you is the fact that um, 
there is a lot that is still not known about soil and plants and the interaction between them. And uh, there are actually multiple theories that exist today about how those minerals get to the plant. But there's a few things that we do know. Uh, most of those macronutrients that I showed you, um, they're actually ions. And so ions are just simply uh, particles that have a positive or negative charge on them, similar to a magnet. Um, and so the clay soil uh, that you have or the clay particles in your soil actually have a negative charge on them as well. And those macronutrients for the most part have a positive charge. And so they will cling to that clay soil, which is an important piece. I mean, think again about water flowing through. If they couldn't, if those, mi those macronutrients or even the micronutrients couldn't cling to the soil, then as water passes through, they could easily be rinsed away. Uh, but in the case where the moisture is correct in your soil, um, what you see here in this illustration is what we call that, that soil solution, that, that, that water clinging to the, to the, the soil particles and to the roots. And, um, and so in this particular case, um, the plant will have root hairs, um, many, many more hairs than I have on my head uh, that reach out and can actually reach into tighter places than the typical roots can. And they have very specialized cells on the end of them. And so they can actually take an exchange. They will exchange um, ionic particles that they have for the ionically charged um, mineral particles that are in the, in, the, in the soil solution. And so this goes back and forth. And, uh, and this is the way that these nutrients that can then get into your plant and, uh, and nourish the plant. And a couple of things I will mention here is um, things like nitrogen and sulfur are actually negatively charged. Uh, and so they're very volatile in your soil. So again, uh, making sure that you're not overwatering uh, is an important part of uh, good soil health. Um, the other piece we'll talk about with the chemistry of, of your soil is pH. Uh, pH is nothing more than just a way to measure how acidic or how alkaline something is, you know, I think you've also heard it as acids and bases. Um, plants prefer uh, to live in a, a pH range of about six to seven and a half for optimal growth. Uh, some plants prefer more acid. Uh, if you're familiar with growing camellias, azaleas, or blueberries, they, they like it a little bit more acid, but, um, but not too much. Um, and, and, and it's important to keep track of your pH. Um, because as this graph illustrates, uh, when you get out of that neutral zone, um, there may be plenty of those nutrients in the soil, but they may become unavailable to your plants. Um, and so in that particular case, um, even adding fertilizers is not going to help your plants because the, the nutrients are being bound up by the, the acidity, the alkalinity of your soil. Um, another thing to, to be very aware of uh, are things that uh, when you get too acidic in your soil, there are minerals that can actually become poisonous to your plants. Things like aluminum, that's not a nutrient to the plant, um, can become very strong in your soil and, uh, and cause problems. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, molybdenum, which is a, another nutrient that is essential to your plants, um, can become poisonous when your soil becomes too alkaline. So, um, you know, typically, um, if you need to raise the pH level, uh, you use some limestone and add that to it. Um, and on the flip side, um, actually adding a calcium carbonate will, uh, a calcium will uh, help with the um, alkalinity uh, um, to, to help remodify that. Um, but it's something that you need to keep track of um, and um, something that is uh, oftentimes overlooked in, in, in soil health. So one of the things we talk about a lot is soil testing. Um, and, and this is something you can do either at home. It's about $25 for a home soil test that are fairly reliable, um, but they are limited to only the macronutrients. Um, and they will help you understand the soil pH. Um, for about twice that amount of money, for about $50, uh, there are soil labs that you can send your soil out to. 
Um, and these um, will test for a much broader spectrum of the minerals that are and nutrients that are in your soil um, and also um, give you good um, insight into the soil pH. Um, but what's really important here is they will also give you recommendations for how to fix any problems that might be out there. So, um, you know, soil test is a good investment. Um, you know, a lot of times it may be cheaper than going out and buying amendments that uh, aren't gonna work for you in the first place. So something to think about. Uh, so in recap, uh, soil is a natural living resource. 99.7% um, of our food comes from soil, directly or indirectly. Um, soil formation occurs very, very slowly. Uh, typically, uh, you know, 500 to 1,000 years for an inch of topsoil. Um, soil can be fragile, uh, as we saw, and uh, easily degraded. Um, keep in mind that soil is half solid, half air and water. Um, and it's the weathering that breaks down the parent materials uh, that, that finally get into the smaller and smaller pieces. And uh, soil is, yes, renewable, but generally not in our lifetime. Ron, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Mike, for the uh, giving us a good background, a summary of the physical and chemical uh, aspects of, uh, of the soil. I'm going to take it a little bit differently and talk about the biological uh, part of soil. And I like to call it the universe beneath your feet. And I hope you get a different appreciation for what you walk upon every day. So the first thing, oops, I went the wrong way. Sorry about that. Um, first thing I want to do before we get into it is for you to just look at this picture and think about something. This is uh, near Aspen, Colorado. It's called the Maroon Bells. It's a very famous place. And I took this picture a couple of years ago when I was there, obviously in, in the autumn. But there's a couple of points I want to make about this scene. Uh, here in the foreground, you see uh, uh, grasses. Um, they're, of course, uh, brown now because of the end of the season. But then you have some shrubs, bigger plants. Then you have the aspen trees in their uh, autumn glory, the yellow deciduous trees. And interspersed among them are the, uh, the pine trees, uh, the various conifers that are up there. My point of this is as follows. This has never been plowed. Nobody has ever tilled this land. Nobody's ever put a pick or a shovel or rototiller in it. Nobody has walked upon this and thrown fertilizer out. Nobody has used biocides. That would be the pesticides, uh, the herbicides, the miticides, any of the sides. Nobody has done that. With the exception of wildlife and a few intrepid hikers, one of which was me when I was a young man walking through this valley and up over the pass, nobody's ever trod on this. And if you look at it, it's doing quite well. It's, in fact, it's doing beautifully. And what is that telling us? Well, it's telling us that nature over the millennia has provided everything that these, this ecosystem needs to survive and to thrive. And that's a very important point as we go through this, because maybe we should be thinking about these biological processes that are active in this valley. And can we incorporate that, at least in concept, into our own gardens? I think everybody's familiar with one or more of these basic gardening principles. Um, use of compost, Mike talked about that. Mulch to keep the, the, uh, the, the heat out and the water in and the weeds down. Don't dig it up too much uh, with the rototiller, with the, uh, the shovel. Don't walk on it, particularly when it's wet. Mike went over that. Um, maybe you don't use uh, so much of the salt heavy fertilizers. And um, this, when I say salt heavy, that's not table salt. Uh, salt is just a descriptive chemical term for the, uh, for the combination of a positive and negative charge molecule. So there's all kinds of salts. But what I'm basically talking about in a general sense is the um, uh, pelleted synthetic fertilizers. So you may or may not use too many of those. Maybe you don't wanna use any of the biocides, the, the pesticides or the herbicides, but then do you know why you're doing all that? 
I bet a lot of you could come up with very sound uh, reasons for this, but I'm gonna give you maybe a different reason that you hadn't thought too much about. A lot of people start a talk when they, or speakers, when they give a talk, they start with a joke or they start with a quote or with a pretty picture. Um, my, I've been told by my family that my jokes are inappropriate for anybody uh, uh, over five years old. So I'll go with a quote. And this is an old quote from a historian and philosopher from 400 BC. And you could exchange the word gardener for farmer and it would be just as relevant. But to be successful, whether it's a farmer or a home gardener, you first have to know the nature of the soil. So what is the nature of the soil? When well, a generic sort of way, you can think of soil health in terms of three kinds of fertility, physical, chemical, and biologic. Now, Mike spent his time talking about the physical and chemical fertility, the structure and the nutrient levels and so on. But I'm gonna now talk about the microbial presence, which you may or may not be aware of. You saw this from Mike's uh, talk. We had given this a, a, a version of this talk to Mass Gardener Trainer and to uh, continuing education. We always like to tell people, you know, if, if you if you go away with a couple important points, and we try to point out which those are, and this is one of them. Mike spent a lot of time on that. This is really critical. Uh, to understanding the soil. And it, we really want you to stress the fact that you should remember this. Now, Mike talked about the pore space over here and the minerals over here, 95% of it. I'm gonna just talk about this little part here of 5% of the total mass of the soil. So I'm looking at that 5% and we have another chart. Now this chart represents only that 5%. What is it made up of? Well, stabilized organic matter. That's organic matter that's been decomposed to its most elemental uh, uh, parts. You've got ones that are actively decomposing things. These are animal bodies, plant bodies are actually decomposing. You've got fresh residues. We're talking roots and leaves and stems and so on. And then of that 5%, only 5% of that are living organisms. Well, what does that mean with respect to the soil? Well, it means it's alive. And I hope you feel as elated about that idea. Uh, it, this is another one of those take home points that you wanna stress with that pie chart, uh, chart that Mike and I showed is that soil is alive. It's very critical. It's very critical to that picture I showed you of the uh, near Aspen of that beautiful valley. Uh, the fact that it's alive is what maintains that ecosystem. So many of you are probably saying, well, John, how alive is it? Well, I'm going to try to give you some of that. And in order to do that, I am going to use a very sophisticated analytical tool and it's called a teaspoon. You probably have one in your kitchen right now. A level teaspoon holds about 4.2 grams of material. That's not very much. Think about just the volume in a teaspoon. It's not very much. So I'm gonna talk about how much life is in that little amount of soil. But before I get to the actual numbers, we have a poll regarding that to see what you guys think. How many bacteria do you think would fit in that one little teaspoon of soil. And it ranges from 400,000 to 4 billion. And actually the answer is, like many people uh, guessed, is 4 billion. That's with a B. And that's a lot. But there's more than just those 4 billion bacteria. And here are the living entities that are microscopic in that soil, in that one single teaspoon of soil. You have the bacteria over here. You see the little rod-shaped guys. They have little flagella, little things that make, help them swim. 4 billion of them. Um, you have another group a big group of 400 million that call actinomycetes. Now, some people, some scientists thought they were the missing link between fungi over here to the right and bacteria over to the left because there's shared characteristics. If you look at the 
the shape of the actinomycetes, they kind of look like that bacteria individually, but yet they're filaments, like the hyphae, which is what the long filaments of fungus are called. So they thought they were the same, but really actinomycetes goes more over to the bacterial uh, point of view. And if you go out after this rain, when it's not muddy, uh, and you go out there and get a double handful of soil from your raised bed or whatever you have, and providing your dog and cat haven't been there, hold it up and sniff that. And that smell of earth is due to actinomycetes. So you've got a lot of the bacterial elements. Then you have the fungal elements. You have almost 4 million uh, a fungal element. And we all know what fungi are. The, back, the uh, toadstools or the mushrooms in your, in your lawn are the fruiting bodies or the reproductive part of a fungus. But much of the activity of the fungus is down below uh, the surface. You see the plant um, um, and the root system, but all this outside the root system is the fungus. And that they work with the roots to help get the nutrients into the plant. And I'll come back a little bit uh, and talk about that. But there's a lot of fungus. And in fact, in that one little teaspoon, if you took all the fungal hyphae, which are the long filamentous strands and laid them end to end, remember they're very microscopic, there would be yards and yards of them in that one teaspoon. Then you have the protozoans. Now, somewhere along the line, most everybody on, the, on this call has, has uh, been introduced to amoeba or paramecia. They are single-celled animals uh, that are called protozoans. And um, there's about 40,000 of them in that teaspoon. And, and to give you a size comparison, a bacterium, if it was the size of a pea, the paramecium, one of these guys, is about the size of a watermelon. And the paramecium, the protozoans eat the bacteria. And um, so they're very critical and protozoans swim um, and they need water to swim. Mike went over that, this microscopic water is critical. If you don't have water in there, you're not gonna have some of these critters in there and you're gonna disrupt the entire uh, biological system uh, underneath there. Believe it or not, there's algae in your soil. And it depends, in where you, depends where you are in the country. Some, we know of algae is growing on the surface of water and we'll see it in swamp your areas, there's more algae. But you see algae everywhere. And algae is part of breaking down uh, the bedrock that Mike was talking about. The last of the microscopic ones are called nematodes. They're little round worms. There are bad nematodes in the soil, but there are, we're talking about the good ones. They are microscopic and they eat bacteria and fungi. So this is in a teaspoon. If you took a shovel full, you're going to probably see some earthworms and maybe an earwig or a roly poly and other uh, what they call arthropods, insects. If you took a dump truck load, you might get a gopher or a mole. So there's a whole scheme of life underneath uh, the, the, uh, your feet. And I wanna bring it back to something Mike said and I said before. The distinction is soil is alive and dirt is not. Dirt is what's in your vacuum cleaner, the floorboards of your uh, car. Um, and um, the, this is the face you should learn how to, to make the next time you hear somebody call soil dirt. So it's very important to remember that it's live. And what are all these microbes doing down there? Well, they're interacting with one another they're competing with one another. They're recycling one another. Let me give you an example. The amount of carbon that a bacterium needs to survive is many times more than what the paramecium needs to survive. So when the paramecium eats the bacteria, it doesn't need all that carbon. So what does it do with it? It excretes it out into the soil. And that carbon now is in a form that can be used by the plants. So these critters are recycling one another by consuming each other. And by doing that, they are enriching the soil. And that's very uh, important considerations when you're thinking about the biology of soil. 
This is the diagram of it. Don't get bamboozled by the fact that there's arrows going every which way, because that's the whole point, that this is a very complex food chain. It starts with the plants, which I'll come back to in a minute. Then you've got the little guys, the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoans who are consumed by bigger uh, creatures that are consumed by bigger creatures. And as this is happening, all the essential elements in the bodies of these creatures are being recycled and used by the plants. But it all starts with the plants. And I have to do a, just a little bit of science here because it's very critical. I think everybody probably knows in concept what photosynthesis is. And I'm not overstating it by saying, if there was no photosynthesis, we would not exist. So the bottom line, it's very complex, by the way. And if you're a science geek like me, you can get just completely enamored with trying to study all that uh, indecipherable molecular biology and biochemistry. But you don't have to go that deep to, to get an appreciation for what it is. Carbon dioxide is in the air. We, we breathe out carbon dioxide. It's taken up by plants. Water is taken up by the plants and be the magic with sunlight to the green parts of the plant, which is called chlorophyll, black magic occurs, oxygen is released along with other compounds. So if you look at this, the, the, uh, the uh, diagram to the right, once again, just reiterating it, is that carbon dioxide, water and light energy and black magic makes sugar and oxygen. Now sugar, is this a catch-all? There's lots of things produced in photosynthesis. Sugar is one of the most basic ones. And then the components of sugar are broken down into their chemical composition, which is then used to make other things. So here's just another diagram. Carbon dioxide in, oxygen out, along with sugar being formed and other compounds, which I'll mention in a minute about what happens to these products from photosynthesis. Well, about three quarters of them go to support the growth and the reproduction and the defensive mechanisms of the plant itself. But the rest of them, about 25% of what's formed during photosynthesis goes down into the roots, out into the soil, and they're called plant exudates. And they go to support all those microbes I talked about. So what is an exudate? Well, you've heard the old cliche that horses sweat, men perspire and women glow. Well, perspiration is one of our exudates. And so it, it's a byproduct of metabolism of how our bodies works or how the plant works and they're exuded or released into the soil. So what are some of these things? Well, there's a whole lot of them, far more than I have here. But you have a whole group of sugars, glucose, sucrose, fructose, galactose. You have proteins, which are macromolecules, which just means big molecules. Everybody's familiar with that. They probably had a protein shake for breakfast or something. Proteins are involved in most anything there is in a plant's life, in a human life. Chemical reactions are catalyzed or sped up by protein. Proteins do everything. The, so whole proteins are exuded through the, uh, from the roots of plants into the soil. Proteins are, are build, built up by building blocks called amino acids. There's about 20 different amino acids. They also are exuded into the soil. The microbes can either use the amino acids or the fully formed proteins for their own. There's a bunch of organic acids. This is not sulfuric acid. It's just different types of acids do all kinds of things. And lastly, a thing called mucilage or mucilage, depending how you pronounce. Well, what is that? If you've ever pulled a plant out of the ground, um, you'll see something like this. You'll see the soil that's stuck to all the roots. And uh, you go, well, what is that? Well, there's mucilage is this sticky, slimy stuff that helps and enhances soil aggregation. Mike talked about soil aggregation. Well, this helps that. It also helps in the storage of water and the storage of nutrients for the plant. If you've ever cut an okra pod in half, 
that slimy stuff that comes out is mucilage. By the way, fried okra is really good, but boiled okra is not so good, but that's just my own personal preference. Anyway, okra has that slimy stuff, that's mucilage. If you break a, a leaf of an aloe vera, that slimy stuff is mucilage that you put on your sunburn or whatever you did. And in the late 1800s uh, and early 1900s, mucilage was actually um, uh, produced and sold as an emollient, skin uh, uh, softener, or a demulcent, which is an anti-inflammatory agent. Uh, right now, that's uh, not being marketed, but uh, mucilage is very, very important. So where does all this go on? Where are the microbes and where are the exudates being uh, uh, sent to? And well, they're sent, scientists really like to use Greek or Latin words, um, uh, word roots, and rhizo simply means root. And the rhizosphere is where all this good stuff happens. It's where the microbes live, where the exudates are, are uh, sent, and where all the interactions go on. Basically, without the fancy word, it just means the root zone. And it means a very narrow area right around the root themselves. So what goes on in the rhizosphere? Well, a lot, far more than we can talk about tonight, but some, just conceptually a few basic things. You have the raw materials. This is what Mike talked about. These are the soil minerals. And there's some organics in there, but you add in the microbes and all of a sudden you have available nutrients to the plants and you have your happy plants. But you may be sitting there going, what does all this mean? Let me give you an example. One of the macronutrients that Mike talked about is nitrogen. It's critical. Everybody knows that, that plants need nitrogen. Nitrogen helps them stay nice and beautifully and beautiful and green. Well, 78% of the air that we're breathing right now is nitrogen gas. Plants are unable to use nitrogen gas. Think of it like this. If you were out in this boat, in the ocean, dying of thirst, you're surrounded by something you can't use because it's not in a form that's compatible with your life. It's salt water. That's the same thing with plants and nitrogen gas. But nature has come up with a way to deal with that. And it has come up with a way to fix, that's just a term they use, that nitrogen can be fixed or changed into a form that plants can use. Plants use nitrogen in certain types of chemical ways. And like I say, nitrogen gas is not one of them. But who does that changing or that fixation of the nitrogen into a form that can be used? Bacteria do that. And there are certain specific types of bacteria. Uh, they're called rhizobium is just one of them. There's other free living types. But these bacteria live uh, closely associated with plants, uh, certain types of plants. Legumes, for instance, Mike mentioned that. Peas, beans, lentils, fava beans. And the bacteria are get associated with the roots of the plant. This is a fava bean. This is a close-up of a fava bean root system. And these are nodules. Nodules is almost like a scab on our skin. It's a reaction of the plant to the presence of the bacteria. And these are the bacteria that take the nitrogen gas and form it into nitrites, nitrates, or ammonium, which is the forms that the plants can use. And so this is a very critical thing. It's, it's a symbiotic relationship. The plant forms exudates that come down and supply proteins, amino acids, and other things for the bacteria who now provide nitrogen to the plant. This is a very critical uh, back and forth. It's a symbiotic relationship. It's very critical to the survival of both uh, parties. Another example is phosphorus. It's another one of the macronutrients. It's essential for plant structures and plant functions. And generally in the soil, phosphorus is in a form that's unavailable to plants. But you add in fungus, different types of fungi, and all of a sudden through the black magic of, of molecular biology and biochemistry, phosphorus is available in a form that a plant can use. 
to, uh, to help it thrive. And my last example is sulfur. Sulfur is considered by some to be the fourth macronutrient and it's involved in um, chlorophyll production and works with nitrogen, but 95% of it's unavailable to plants until the microbes get involved and then it is available. Now, what do we make of all this? It's complicated, we could only scratch the surface in this. But the point is that there's biological processes going on underneath the surface of the ground that are critical to the maintenance of your plants and a sustainable ecosystem. Whether your ecosystem is a, a rose garden, a veggie bed, an orchard, whatever it is, this is all a well-defined orchestrated system that we can enhance and help it work, uh, get the microbes to help us do better in the garden. So remember, this is kind of is a, 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 the summary of both the talks tonight, that healthy productive soil takes centuries to create. Mike said that. The soil food web, all the microbes and the macrobes is essential to maintaining that health. health. Essential to maintaining that valley in Colorado with those beautiful uh, aspen trees. But soil can be degraded very quickly and much of it is due to our action or inaction. So as a kind of an attempt to summarize what Mike and I talked about, it's difficult. It's such a complex and big topic. But nonetheless, how can we try to enhance the soil health in our backyard? Well, cover is good and your round cover is better. What does that mean? Remember, plants provide exudates. Exudates are critical to the survival of the microbes who produce things that are critical to the survival of the plant. So you wanna keep plants growing in your garden, if you can, year round. Mike mentioned cover crops. There's gonna be a talk later in the, the year about cover crops. And um, it's really, I have them in my yard, Mike, we have them in our demonstration garden. We're just keeping everything alive. We're keeping those microbes alive because if you let them dry up or if you let the plants dry up and there's nothing, uh, no exudates coming, what happens to the microbes? So um, that's very critical to keep things growing all the time. I hope I've made the, uh, the point that microbes matter. Um, they're, very, they're very important to the health of your soil. Diversity is indispensable. I couldn't really get into it, but not all plants produce the same exudates. Some exudates drive away uh, pathogenic or bad guy bacteria. Other exudates draw good guys in. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, interactions. So you want to have different types of plants, no matter what your ecosystem is, a, a perennial bed, a veggie bed, an orchard. You want diversity to help keep the microbes and everybody happy. Mike mentioned this kind of be knowledgeable about chemicals. We can't get into it now, but be knowledgeable about what you're putting in the soil. Um, uh, not all chemicals are good, not all chemicals are bad either, uh, but your pesticides, your herbicides, your roundups are all chemicals. Be mindful of what you use because a fungicide that you use can kill those critical fungi that are out there helping your plants. Try to avoid aggressive tillage. Um, sometimes, of course, you have to get the rotor tiller out there. You have to get the pick and the shovel out there and this clay soil and break it up. But as Mike mentioned towards the end there, then you start getting the, the organics in there and it will um, start becoming real soil. And then you don't have to dig it up because if you dig it up, you're breaking the hyphae of the fungus, you're disrupting things, you're killing uh, microbes. So you want to... Uh, Avoid it as much as you can. And lastly, avoid compaction. You drive out the air, you drive out the water, as Mike said. So our plea to you is to please go out and get your hands in the soil and learn to love and to protect the universe beneath your feet.